It is absolutely no secret that animatronics are kind of creepy or really creepy. And surprise, surprise, Japan is no stranger to creepy animatronics. I've gone ahead and compiled some pretty off-putting ones and some pretty off-putting stage shows, some with kind of nefarious intent. So yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> Thing that exists. Allow me to introduce you to a bit of obscure SNK or Neo Geo lore. These characters on stage were playable in the fighting game King of Fighters. It's basically SNK's answer to Street Fighter. So this begs the question, why does this exist? Well, it's one part SNK video game lore and one part 90s amusement park attraction. You see, in the 1990s, Neo Geo games were so popular that they launched several theme parks throughout Japan. This was somewhat of a trend back then, as Sega did something similar with its Sega World locations. Wow, that was a lot of S's. <laughs> so, what's my point here? SNK was huge during the Neo Geo heyday, and King of Fighters was their biggest property, so it was only natural for SNK to want to take advantage of the opportunities. By the way, SNK is the video game and hardware developer. SNK produced Neo Geo. Like if Sony made a PlayStation Park, which no, is not something they ever did despite sounding like something they did do at some point. <laughs> Anyways, getting back to the point here, Neo Geo's first theme park location was known as Neo Geo Land. But that's not what we're talking about today. What we're going to be talking about is Neo Geo World, opened in 1996 and meant to cater to a wider demographic. This demographic included teens and adults. Unlike Neo Geo Land, Neo Geo World was open late, reportedly until midnight. There were a few King of Fighters related events and attractions at Neo Geo World, most notably location testing for the new games prior to their release. However, it was one specific area within the park, known as the Band of Fighters stage area, where this nightmare fuel had recited, from 1996 up until the park's closure in 2001. So, going back to what I said a little earlier, the characters featured in the animatronic show are playable in King of Fighters. You may recognize Terry Bogard specifically. And, you know, real quick, in case you are wondering, the other band members are Athena Asamiya, Kyoku Sanagi, Yori Yagami, and Nakoruru. The weird thing with the Band of Fighters as a, well, fictional band is that the band does not exist in the game series canon. It's more of a side thing that exists in an alternate universe. So perhaps Band of Fighters is meant to be the versions of these characters that we get in the real world? The show itself features unique music made for the band and recorded by the official voice actors. Despite the show being a permanent fixture of Neo Geo World for years, very little footage exists. So here we have a bit of lost media. The other one kind of counted as lost media, but this one's true at its core lost media. This stage play would not be confirmed to exist at all if it wasn't for the images that surfaced of it. That is how obscure it is. And also a bit of a side note, this suit is not what's referred to as a suit. In Japanese, it's a kigurumi. This will be important to keep in mind later because we're going to look at some more of these. This stage show is based on Urusei Yatsura, Rumiko Takahashi's first anime and manga to gain widespread attention. While the manga itself debuted in 1978, the anime really took off during its 1981 premiere. This stage show included, intended for a child audience. There's thought to be no surviving footage, at least none of it has surfaced online as of right now. This makes the show itself completely lost, though quite a few images ranging in levels of cursed have survived. The first to surface being this one on Twitter in 2017 by somebody who worked on the show itself. It's possibly the most cursed. They would also go on to post these two photos a few months later. 
The first Twitter post also says these costumes had either deteriorated or were thrown away after the show. Props like this often deteriorate and aren't built to last in general, I, I mean... <laughs> More photos would follow from other Twitter users, here's a little montage of them all. What's interesting is how some look like scans from some kind of magazine covering the show. The year or even locations of the stage play aren't even confirmed, though thought to be sometime in the early 80s, particularly between 1982 and 1985. Even the official name of the stage play is unknown. Some users have referred to the show as the Urase Yatsuda Birthday Festival, or just simply the Urase Yatsuda Show. It could have been referred to as either one, or even both at some point. What has been reiterated by various Japanese Twitter users is how the stage show was recorded by a professional film crew at some point. This allows the possibility of a full recording of the show intending for an official release or TV broadcast. Though we have no clue if this footage even exists still. This whole thing has become somewhat of a popular lost media topic in Japan, as a lot of people online are interested in unearthing more details and possibly footage of this show. It appears to linger in the memories of many people in Japan. And, I mean, when the costumes look like this, I mean, who could forget them? <laughs> This guy right here may be among the most terrifying in the video, or in general even. Though, at the very same time, the end result may be among the most impressive, especially for the era. So, even from these nightmarish photos, you can tell that this is an animatronic of Godzilla, or Gojira as he's known in Japan. And while typically this monster and other related kaiju are depicted on camera by actors in bodysuits even today in 2023, this 1984 instance differed slightly. The film this animatronic was made for was titled Return of Godzilla or simply Gojira, just like the 1954 original film. But yeah, anyways, this film was meant to have very impressive and also very expensive visuals. This was 1980s bubble economy Japan and a lot of money was often thrown at a lot of trivial things such as this. And this. So, commissioning an expensive animatronic wasn't out of the ordinary for the era. The animatronic itself was dubbed Cybot Godzilla, and this bad boy stood a whopping 20 feet in height. Though, unfortunately, despite the hefty production costs and overall impressiveness of this thing for, you know, 1984, Cybot Godzilla was only featured in a handful of scenes in the final film. And most of these were just close-up shots that didn't even show the full animatronic. What's also weird? In addition to this, the final Godzilla suit for this film didn't really resemble the animatronic either. But yeah, the film was critically acclaimed in Japan and even won a Japanese Academy Award for its, you guessed it, special effects. Though, the film got somewhat of a Saban treatment when localized for North American audiences. And it was not well received at all. Towards the end of Sailor Moon's initial anime run in Japan, there existed a modest and somewhat obscure stage show. 
shown to small audiences in shopping centers, theme parks, and even raceways from 1994 to 1995. Now, Sailor Moon in itself is no stranger to live-action adaptations. There have been 31 musical adaptations since 1993 and even a live-action TV show in 2003. But this specific incarnation definitely stands out from the rest. See, while typical said a Mew, the abbreviated term combining Sailor Moon and musical, make use of actresses in elaborate cosplay, this stage show implemented full costumes, complete with some very detailed yet uncanny masks. This show, in itself, known at most showings as simply a Sailor Moon Sailor Star show, was synced to the pre-recorded audio by the original voice actors themselves, and as the name suggests, follows a story that takes place during the Sailor Star's story arc, that being the fifth and final series of the anime. While a lot of footage of these shows exists online, consisting of home video recordings that even include fan interactions with the characters, there's not much documentation on the details of the show itself. This includes the plot, locations it was shown at, and how long it actually ran. This location in Japan is infamous to urban explorers for its abandoned animatronics. Animatronics that have been abandoned for almost two decades now. Let's start from the top, though. Western Village was once a Wild West-themed amusement park located in a particularly mountainous part of Tochigi Prefecture. The location itself was originally a family-owned ranch owned by the Kinugawa family in the 1970s. And because this ranch had some livestock and a fishing pond, the Kinugawa family decided to make their property an attraction as they were somewhat close to a popular hot spring in the area. And the Kinugawa family ranch eventually became the Western Village theme park and lasted until around 2006. Now, it was at some point between the 70s and mid-90s that these various animatronics were created and utilized throughout the park animatronics that were just left here to deteriorate once Western Village closed its doors permanently. And we're not just talking about one or two simple animatronics either. There is a significant number of them up here. Who knows if all the original animatronics are still there, but a significant amount still appears to be up there. A lot of the buildings and restaurants and different fixtures still stand as well. It quite literally looks like those Wild West ghost towns it was meant to replicate in the 1970s up until 2006. And now its only residents are decaying, lifeless animatronics. And with all of that said, I haven't come across any videos of the animatronics actually working back when the park was open. As far as the future of these things, it seems like they may just be destined to rot away in the years to come. Between 1995 and 2002, some rather concerning stage shows made their way to different locations throughout Japan. These productions initially appeared no different from commonplace ones such as the Udase Yatsura and Sailor Moon shows we just talked about. I mean, this just kind of looks like a standard issue Doraemon stage play. I mean, yeah, a little low budget, but nothing particularly noteworthy to delve into, right? Well, once the actual subject matter and plot of the play itself was looked into, that's when it became pretty noteworthy. These inconspicuous live-action productions were run by Kenshokai, a religious organization founded in 1957 within Saitama City. In addition to the public shows, these plays were also presented at Kenshokai's religious camp retreats. Oh, and yeah, while many of you are already likely assuming this, these plays were not created with the permission of the creators. I assure you, TV Asahi had no say in this. So, what does the play itself entail? 
For starters, Doraemon and Nobita, the main characters of the original series, are depicted as devout, loyal followers of Ken Shokai. Like, really, really into it. During the course of the play, they continuously ridicule a man named Taisaku Ikeda. And who is this? A character from the series, maybe? Uh, no, actually. He's the president of another religious... organization known as Soka Gakkai. Apparently, this is a religious organization that Ken Shokai greatly detested and generally disliked. The Doraemon show claims that they're in some kind of conflict with each other. These Ken Shokai productions remained in obscurity until 2015. This was when a video recording of one of the Doraemon shows surfaced on the Nico Nico Doga. From here, people in Japan memed on it a whole lot. Following this online spread, some came forward claiming many other versions of the Ken Shokai stage plays did exist. Productions that also illegally use characters from Super Sentai, Pokemon, and Anpanman. Anyways, that is all I have for you guys today. If you like this kind of stuff, make sure you subscribe and click that little bell. I've got a lot of videos on the way, something for everyone. Oh, also, I stream now. I've been doing these fun little chill research streams on the weekends on YouTube, but I also have plans to stream video games on Twitch, so if you're into that, the link's on my channel. The Twitch streams are coming very soon. And I also have a Patreon and YouTube membership, so if you guys are interested in either of those, the benefits are slightly different, but um, they're there. I actually have a lot of plans as far as benefits and little perks with those, so once I hit 150 subscribers, I'm going to be announcing a lot of cool things that you can get when you, you know, sign up for the Patreon or YouTube membership. But yee, that is it. See you all in the next video, guys.